feel like pine is kind of like yarrow. It's this very multifaceted, it's the, the polycrest, the herb of many actions that I often come back to in relation to so many body systems and so many kind of conditions. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. This episode was so much fun. Kat is hilarious and quirky while sharing an impressive amount of information about pine, a tree that she clearly loves. I know you're going to love this episode. For those of you who don't already know her, Kat McKinnon is a registered herbalist with the AHG and has been a certified clinical herbalist and nutritionist through the NAIMH since 2011. Kat is the founder and director of Meet the Green, through which she runs a private clinical practice and teaches classes on herbalism and ancestral skills. She is the co-founder of Plant Camp, an online and in-person botanical learning community. She has also been primary faculty at the Colorado School of Clinical Herbalism in Lafayette, Colorado since 2012, and the clinic program director, where she mentors student clinicians at the Public Low Cost Clinic and is a principal reviewer of student clinician cases. Well, thank you so much for being here, Kat. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be able to connect with you. I've known you through the years of what's um, been going on in your world, and we share a mutual friend, and Mm -hmm. I'm just excited to really be able to connect with you here, and I'd love to start with your herbal story. So I, I am originally from Connecticut, and my, my grandmother uh, was a farmer, and then my mother is a horticulturalist, and um, so I've just been kind of surrounded by plant nerds since the beginning. So that was, that was very useful. And there was always just like, you know, it was always plant people, not just like, those are plants and they're green things. It was like, oh, look, it's a little like, you know, such and such a kiss. So that was kind of the beginning into that world. And then I had, you know, like it's Connecticut. So it's lots of sweet fern tea it was kind of just in my childhood. And we kind of just make that as a matter of course, every summer, kind of just like playing at being witches and <laughs> being them at the being witches at the same time. Uh, and then when I got older, I got into uh, the ancestral skills world. And, you know, I took a number of classes for Tom Brown Jr., who's a fellow who does a lot of, uh, he has, runs the tracker school on the East Coast there. And my brothers and I got into that. And that kind of opened up this world of wild foods and, um, and then medicine as well, kind of like plants as medicine and really getting into that. And, you know, I studied, as a lot of us do, kind of self-study in the beginning. And then I took a little break. I call it my break from herbalism uh, to go to college in northern Arizona for forestry. I was like, I need to do something with plants. And that that's a job that involved plants. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't quite what I thought it was. But I studied forestry and anatomy and physiology for a bunch of years. And, and then was like, ooh, this is, mm, this is still off. So came back to the East Coast and, um, and started to work for a nonprofit uh, that Tom Brown started, working with ancestral skills for kids and families and got even more into that world and more pulled into the plant skills. Um, I took, like so many of us, Rosemary Gladstar's distance course. That was like my first, you know, on paper education with herbs, um, studied with an herbalist um, named Linda Runyon and... And kind of just decided at a certain point, like, I want to do this for a living. And I moved out to Boulder, Colorado and studied with Paul Bergner during some of his final years here with uh, the North American Institute of Medical Herbalism. 
And I went through that clinic program uh, and then Lisa Ganora purchased the school and it became the Colorado School of Clinical Herbalism and started teaching. I used both my like my botanical training and my anatomy training. My poor, long suffering parents are like, what are you going to do with anatomy degree, like an, an anatomy minor with like forestry studies? Like, what do you think you're going to do? And I was like, ah, perfect. So I, I kind of started working with teaching anatomy and physiology and materia medica and just kind of started making herbalism my work. And then a couple of years ago, took over the clinic program there at CSCH and yeah, just still getting sucked in. And I guess if that's, I think that's probably, that's the short version. Like there's lots of little stops and wells and along the way, uh, but that's kind of the, that's the general gist of things. Well, it's always surprising to me when I have folks on and I hear their story and how much I have in common with their story. I feel like it happens with every single person and you are no exception, Kat, because mm. guess how I got started? Oh, Tom Brown Tracker School. Yeah. No way. Yeah, I wonder how many herbalists oh. that he has like inadvertently oh, created. Oh my God, where were you there? I have to know. <laughs> uh, well, so I didn't go East Coast. I was West Coast. So uh, it was in the Santa Cruz area that yeah, I took Santa his classes Cruz, yeah. and then studied with Karen and Frank Sherwood, who was oh. um, instructors at a school for a long time. So, uh, awesome. and then later I began my clinical stuff with Paul Bergner, again, from a distance, though I didn't make it to Colorado. So, so many similarities there. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I didn't know that. See, I should have done my homework on you before I came. That's so fun. Yeah. Well, it's um, wonderful to hear your story and just, you know, the meandering ways of how we become herbalists. And um, another thing about me is I live in a pine forest. And so I'm really mm -hmm. excited to hear about uh, all that you have to share about pine. Mm. Oh, God. I know. I'm like, okay, we have about an hour for this podcast. We really need five more. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, man. That's, you know, it's funny because pine in the beginning of my getting into food as medicine and plants as medicine, pine was one of those first ones, you know, I, I kind of you know, came to, to herbal consciousness. I feel like everybody has their plants that kind of were like, oh, my God, you can like plants. I will devote my life to this. And pine was one of them. It's like yarrow, melon, pine. Um, <laughs> And pine needle tea was one of those first kind of, you know, mind like, oh my God, I've seen this. I've been surrounded by white pines, you know, in Connecticut, that's the predominant pine around there. Um, and or the native pine. And it was in the Jersey Pine Barrens and we were making pine needle tea and I kind of just saw it off to the corner. I'm like, what are they doing with those pine needles? Like they were like taking them and putting them in a clay vessel with all this like, you know, steam coming off of it. And I'm like, what are they gonna do with that? And then, the first cup was just this explosion of like, oh my God, this is everything. Like it tastes so good and it smells so good. And there's this, you know, with a lot of pines, like it's not, um, there's of course like the sappiness, everybody thinks of pines and there's that like, oh, like it smells like pine or there's this resinous nature to it. But then you get into the needle mess medicine and actually tasting it. And it's the complexity of the aromatics and the tastes, you know, the astringency, and then you have the bitter, and then you have the sweetness, plus this pungency, plus these aromatics. And it just it just reached its organoleptics into my soul and grabbed me. Uh, and I've kind of been like heart linked with that plant ever since I would, I tell my students like, if I could bleed resin, I would, you know, I've been, <laughs> like, <laughs> I've been dreams about that before where I'm like, I am a pine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't know where you want me to start. I feel like I could continue to just wax on, but if you have any guidance for what you want to talk about first, um, you can start with medicine or food or, or whatever. Oh, yeah, I, I want it all. Um, <laughs> one thing that comes to mind is that just to start, people often wonder, what about my pine? Like you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. you know, white pine. People might be like, what, what pine do I have and can I use it? Ooh, oh, that's such a good question. Um, I thought about that before coming on to this because I'm like, it always comes up in the discussion of pine. Mm -hmm. So there's 49 to 51 pines, depending on who you talk to. I feel like there's like 49-ish native ones. If you talk to some botanists, they're like, no, there's 52. Anyway, there's a lot of pines and they're all throughout North America. And they're kind of, you know, tip to tail. Like they all, they go, you know, all the way from really cold climates, you know, way up in Alaska, you know, kind of tundra area. And then you're down into tropical areas where there are pines that like to be in wetland areas and kind of some more unique pines that can, you know, compared to what we consider with like, you know, the pine type of, you know, Christmas tree. And as long as it's a pinus species, so there's pine family, pinaceae, and then there's the pinus genus. And really when we're talking about pine medicine, I, in my mind, I kind of think of, 
I kind of think of everybody, you know, in the pine family as having a, a similar nature, if not exactly the same. Um, so there's firs and spruce, et cetera, but, but just sticking to the pinus genus, if you have a pine species, if it's actually pinus, it's medicine, it's food, you know, all of them have a similar, not exactly the same nature. Like they all have, it's just like apples, you know, every apple has a distinct taste or a distinct, you know, kind of smell aromatic profile. It's the same with pines, but we're kind of talking about, you know, it's the same, it's the same neighborhood medicinally. And, and as far as edibles too, the big thing that comes up is pines that are not pines. So you is not a pine totally it's a taxis is the genus and it's a totally other slightly toxic evergreen and it's a conifer you know you've got conifer species that are a little bit toxic so i think people will mix those two things up they'll mix up conifer which just means cone bearing so it's like juniper and cypress and like western cedar which is those are all you know in the realm of either low dose or just frankly toxic um, or you have things that aren't even conifer or like that are totally different like norfolk island pine if you've heard of that before mm -hmm. that's like the predominant quote-unquote pine in hawaii i had a student who texted me and was like which pine is this i'm like it's not <laughs> because it's it's what is it aura or a casey or something it's aura carinians is the kind of the family um so as long as you actually have a pinus genus you're okay the big uh, have you heard of pine being toxic have you come across i, I wanted i wanted to ask you about that because um the first time somebody told me that i was like no um, but then I was like, oh, I should probably look into it more. Uh, and so I did. And it often comes up specifically with, um, ponderosa pines. And there was, I mean, now it's kind of hazy in my mind. I know I did a video covering this, but it was something like, you know, cattle ate an amazing amount of, uh, pine. And that was a problem for the animal, but that it's not mean that, it, that it's toxic in any way, shape, or form for humans who have been interacting with ponderosa pine specifically for eons. So yeah, it's like I drink pine needle tea made with ponderosa needles still here. Yeah, totally. And it's not like, I think there's this, you know, the biggest thing that comes up with pines, but especially ponderosa pine, which I feel like, I mean, I don't have to go more into it, but you've that brief synopsis. I'm all, I'm like cows, cows. <laughs> Cow, are you a cow? Do you have a rumen? Do you have many stomachs? No, then <laughs> like, because it's you know all the studies they did were either like a, they ate like forty pounds of like the twigs, the bark, the leaves, and I'm like just don't do that, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, or they like gavage fed the cows. I did the calculations similar to you, and I calculated out. I'm like, how much pine needle tea would I need, assuming I'm a cow? And assuming that I'm like, there's no other companion molecules protecting, and it's like I would have to drink eight and a half gallons of tea in an eight hour period of time, I'd be in so much trouble if I had just that much water. So it's like, yeah, yeah. but yeah, the, the main thing that comes up is abortifacient. You heard of that? Like it's going to cause miscarriage mm -hmm. the thing. Um, and there's like the, well, there's lots of vitamin C in pine needles and lots of vitamin C can cause, you know, pregnancy trouble and miscarriage. And, and it's just sort of all types of ridiculous. And it's always like ponderosa pine and you and Norfolk Island pine are all mentioned in the same breath. And right. every time I see it, I'm like, <laughs> Ooh, like it gets my goat so much because it's this it's this very like mystifying and I don't know it's just bad PR <laughs> for the pine family and it's silly because it's just like copy and pasted copy and pasted copy and pasted by yep. you know somebody doing yep. a wild foods or an herbalism thing so same deal right whether it's the, as long as you don't eat 40 pounds of the twigs and leaves and Noted. bark you're gonna do okay <laughs> Uh, but ponderosa that's actually um one of the in the recipe that i gave you all that's that's the pine that i usually use around here because i'm i'm in colorado so the the main pine in my bio region kind of in the foothills where i had the most exposure to is that ponderosa pine and you yeah. know been making elixirs and cookies and ferments and soda and tinctures and honeys and still alive no kidney damage no liver damage no no anything so yeah I love that you have a whole video on that. I'm like, yes, excellent. <laughs> Writing that into the world, Absolutely. demystifying that weird toxicity aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also like personally offended by it. just, you know, I look out into a ponderosa pine, you know, forest every mm -hmm. day. And yeah, so I, I love them like you do. Um, well, let's maybe dive into some medicine and uh, and then we can talk about the recipe that you shared with us as well. Yeah, totally. I, you know, I'm thinking about pine. There's an... 
you know, I mentioned yarrow is one of my first herbs. I feel like pine is kind of like yarrow. It's this very multifaceted, I mean, what herb isn't multifaceted? But it, for me, it's the, the polycrest, the herb of many actions that I often come back to in relation to so many body systems and so many kind of conditions. Um, the one thing that I really think of with pine is just the respiratory system and the, the aromatics and, you know, pine, just like any of our aromatics, it kind of goes into the system and through all of our systems and kind of turns things up, you know, so there's that kind of like mild menagogue action and carminative and bitter, but in relationship to the respiratory system, I think that's often what I put it in the most uh, for anything to do with the respiratory system that involves tightness or stuckness. So that can look like sort of the, Flemmy stuckness, right? You're like, <clears throat> like I was just, um, I was just recently um, sick, non-COVID sick, but respiratory sick. And that was one of the things that was happening is there was this like consistent stuckness and kind of just crud, you know, the kind you get in the shower. This is an herbalist podcast, right? This will be fine. You know, you get in the shower, you get the hot steam and everything comes up. Um, so like that kind of stuckness and that kind of crud, uh, as well as emotional stuck crud you know I, I think of it I actually put it into a lot of my formulations uh, for folks who have depression as kind of this this heart exhilarant but also especially when there's either depression or grief that manifests as this like creature that's like mm -hmm. sitting on your chest or that's like reaching into you and squeezing your lungs um, I lost my father rather suddenly in the past year just this last summer and I took so much pine because <laughs> I would wake up and just like, like it would be this just like physical manifestation. And I couldn't, it wasn't panic exactly. Um, there were moments of that too, but just these moments of just your breath gets taken away and it feels like your, your lung capacity is half of what it was. And it's hard to, hard to breathe deep. You know, that, that grief residing in the lungs, that nature of grief. So pine has been something along with I think that pine elixir recipe you know that's that's part of why I like it too is there's this element of of bitterness to the pine and to the you know the, even the fresh needle medicine um so there's that bitter aspect but there's also this this sweetness I think that's inherent with pine uh that's part of why it makes such a lovely tea so you have that bitterness and the aromatics plus that little bit of sweetness plus the sweetness of the honey itself and it makes for this sort of heart and lung tonic that just lets you lets you open up and breathe a little easier mm. um, so yeah I, I've really I uh, just that's what came out first um but that that's something that I really I don't know I I haven't seen that in the books as much but I've experienced it so profoundly with myself and with my students you know and all of our students who do you know their herbs of the week on pine or or we go into the field and we do our botany and we sit under pine and there's this persistent and we don't we try not to color the situation and be like so this is pine and it's really good for grief like we just say like this is pine go sit under it <laughs> and what tends to come back is this this elder medicine this grandmother nature medicine and then people often and i think it happens when people sit down and slow down enough their tears will often come but especially with the pine there's this like <gasps> like people will people just sob and just say like, oh my God, like I, I had this thing that was there and I just feel like, I feel like I can breathe. I feel like, you know, and just tasting a bit of that needle, I've, I've moved something that needed to be moved. That was, you know, on a physical level and then on that energetic, emotional level as well. So that was one of my recent favorite things about pine that I've really, really been digging into in the last couple of years. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I love how pine, you know, especially as it grows up to be big and strong, it does have that comforting feeling of just mm. like I've sat beside many pine myself and it, it is such a comfort. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the, just the physical nature of them and the ecology. They're, they're host to so much. And I, that's part of why I also love pine is it's this force on the landscape. And you, know, you have your planted individual pines, but most of the pines that I see kind of in there, in their bioregion, in their habitat, it's usually, you know, a, a mature forest or sometimes like a secondary forest, but it's, it's this, yeah, it's this profound presence and their, their smell and their nature and the, the habitat that they provide. 
um, it's this medicine all on its own, just that you can actually like, you can step into and you kind of feels like you're wearing it like a cloak or something. It's just like, Oh, it's going to be good. Like it's going to, no, it's not going to be good, but it's going to be okay. There's that, that primalness. I feel like you tap into as, as humans or as like human animals that I feel like that's really true. Um, yeah. And so I think that that, that medicine and the persistence of it and the abundance of it, there's that just, even people who don't know a whole lot about pine, you know, I'll do plant walks where uh, it's folks who are, you know, inside kitties for the most part. They're like, you know, I'm in, I'm in the, the tech area kind of here. I'm near Boulder County. So there's a lot of people who work for Google or IBM or whatever. And they'll kind of just come on a plant walk just on a whim or something like that. And we'll, we'll step into a grove of pines and they'll change. They'll have that visceral just like, ooh, like something unwinds or something reprograms. And people just kind of chill out. Yeah. I love that. I love that nature of pines too, the way that they can hold us as humans. So we've talked about medicine for the lungs, both stuck mm. physical congestion, stuck grief. Um, what else would you say about pine medicine? Um, so, God, where to start? Digestively, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like the as a digestive tonic, even just pine needle tea by itself, maybe balanced with a little bit of honey or, or something else that kind of provides a little bit of moisture, uh, has this multiplicity, this laundry list of actions that are appropriate for the injury to the gut. Uh, and that's from indigestion to kind of uh, feelings of sluggishness in the gut, so kind of slow digestion in general, uh, but also kind of like sour stomach after eating or feelings of fullness after eating or um, I'm, I'm a sensitive, delicate petunia and I, you know, corn and gluten are things that I just wreak havoc on my digestive system. And I, as a tincture or as a tea, but as a simple, the, the bitterness, the astringency and the aromatics that bring in that carminative effect, uh, I find are just really useful. And I put in most of my bitters formulas and most of my kind of, um, I have just general formula that I keep on me on the regular uh, in my digestive kind of like tummy troubles formula. It's one of the, it's one of the, you know, six or seven herbs that I'll keep in there for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of provides this movement. I think of it, I think of it, I'm in the, you know, Colorado in the Southwest. It's like, it's like our version of ginger, you know? Mm -hmm. So when, <laughs> when the supply chain fails uh, okay. and everybody runs out of ginger, I'm like, Oh, pine. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of our perfect analog. Um, and it has a very, you know, with its spiciness and with its movement, I feel like that's, that's a similar correlative for analog nature to ginger. Um, I think so for everything from constipation to kind of just general like collie wobbles, you're like, oh, I just ate too much this, that or the other thing. Um, as a simple or usually I'll, I'll put it in formula kind of to fit that niche, that kind of similar to ginger niche. So digestive wise, uh, reproductive wise, at least for the kind of tract that I have. So kind of for, especially for looking at working with stuck menses. Uh, so I'll occasionally put pine in formula or just, you know, when I, when I'm traveling and I don't have anything else, I'm like, what, what do I have? Probably you'll have pine somewhere near you, but, you know, drinking cups of pine little tea to help with bringing on menses when you have that, like, I'm stuck, I'm bloated kind of irritable my digestion is weird and i'm crampy like for that piece of of movement again it's like those aromatics moving through the body uh but it's gentle it's not like a you know kick your ass kind of like don guai or damiana or something like that it's it's a little bit more in the realm of it's somewhere between like oh probably like a chamomile like chamomile and melissa is like very gentle menagogues to you know let's say don guai is over here pines like somewhere right along in here. So it should take a lot of it to have like a really strong effect, but even just that gentle movement, uh, I feel like is incredibly useful. Um, what else? I, one thing I'm wondering is how do you like to make your pine needle tea? Like fresh needles, dried needles, simmered, steeped for how long? Mm -hmm. I want, I want all the details. Well, so one, so for the kind of, let's say for the digestive tonic effect or for the humanagogue effect, just using the fresh needles cut, I find that that's, that's got the most potency. I've made it from dried needles before, but I feel like 
dried needles, unless you keep them really well and they're quite young when you pick them, they kind of lose their potency. That's what I feel um, like too. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't happen as much with like the fur and the spruce species. I feel like you can pick those tips and they, they'll maintain their potency. Like they won't have as much of the bitter astringency, but for whatever reason, pine. And you know, I honestly, I, I've only experimented a little bit because pine is one of those year round medicine cabinet plants, you know? So it's Same kind of like, yeah. why would I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's sort of like, I'm going to dry my lemon out. And you're like, well, but what about fresh lemons? You know, it, it feels kind of like that, that equivalent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the fresh needle for the tea. Uh, I've simmered it before too. I find, oh, this is great. I can ask you. I find that the boiled or simmered needle has a mild to moderate laxative effect. And I don't know whether that's because you're losing the aromatics or there's this concentration of resins or whatever it is, or maybe it's the particular pine species I've tried. It's, it's mainly white pine. Um, and I haven't honestly tried to replicate the process, um, <laughs> but I've seen it happen with myself. And then with a number of um, my students that uh, do it as an herb of the week, they're like, whoops, that was intense. So I, the sim, I don't tend to simmer it. One, because it ruins whatever pot or not ruins, but it permanently marks a pot as like, this is your pine pot now because it's all the resins that just stick to the sides. And also for that like mild to moderate laxative effect. So I, anyway, that's, I guess if you I need it. I haven't noticed that, but I do notice the, um, the simmering, like it makes the, con the decongestive properties mm. um, much more pronounced. Mm. And so that's what I will turn to that for if like, you know, that deep congestion, like I need a, a big mover in the lungs. I'll mm. do a simmering. Um, yeah. When it's just the needles or are you yeah, just the needles. Or, yeah, no, no, just the needles. Huh. I wonder if that's an element of like the, the tonic astringency, um, cause you're covering and you're like keeping all your aromatics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. etc. How long are you simmering for? Uh, 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So that's like a solid, like long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and this could just be my individual reaction, but I mostly just do steams for that reason, or I'll do, mm -hmm. you know, like a, 20 drops of tincture in a cup of like saline or something like that. Um, instead of the sim, instead of the, the taking it internally. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I'm so interested. I wonder if that's just like really pronouncing the resins mm -hmm. uh, and extracting those from, from the needles and concentrating that. Cause that's, that seems to, I don't know, just thinking out loud, that seems to make sense that it would like really like m create a lot more movement from the lungs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's see. All right. Other things. Oh, topicals. Do you work with topicals for with pine? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's very generous in gifting its um, pine pitch. So mm. yeah, I love the, the resins, like the mm -hmm. strong resins in, in liniments and in salves for just kind of, you know, all the aches and pains. It has this sort of camphory like, like camphor, but a little more mild, you know, it's very, lots of movement, lots of warmth. Um, and I love that. And that's, and most of my pain liniments and uh, topical kind of muscle rubs and things like that for that warmth um, as well as, and then of course, you know, it's so famous for wounds and wound care. I feel like the, that was one of my first salves that I learned how to make was just, you know, no beeswax, no anything else, just the oil and the resin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, uh, I'm just in love with that forever. I get, I, I wear a lot of sandals. I'm barefoot a lot of the time in the summer and I end up getting these like cracks in the heel, mm -hmm. you know, that you get when you're out barefoot or you're out kind of just in the woods, even with sandals just all the time. And, you know, that's the, the power of that medicine. I feel like I'll put like a little bit of that resin salve or sometimes just the resin itself into those kinds of cracks and injuries that are just, they're slow healing. They're in places where you're moving it a lot in the body. Um, and it's this like this perfect binding agent slash antimicrobial. So there's that. That's interesting. I use cottonwood for that very yeah. specific thing. You know, both those resins are, mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Well, it makes sense that correlation of just like this strong, like usually comes along with like a giant parcel of essential oils for that like antimicrobial or volatile oils for that antimicrobial effect. Um, but then just that, yeah, that knitting together nature of things. 
Uh, but that's like, for me, that's cottonwood is another one that I'll put like in my formulations for wound salves that I'll just keep on me. It'll be something like, you know, pine resin, some cottonwood resin, you know, sometimes some hypericum, but that's, you know, almost pretty consistently one of the players that I'll keep in wound formulas is that, that tough aromatic resin. Mm, love it. Mm. Um, I think you mentioned previously vitamin C, but I think that's, you know, a lot of people's entryway into pine is, yeah. oh, it has vitamin C. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, um, so I know you've had Lisa Ganora on your show here before, but I've, uh, I've talked to her a good bit about this and I think about it. It's like, it's not just vitamin C, it's vitamin C and friends, right? And all the other associated antioxidants uh, that you need for kind of, for that antioxidant effect. And I, I think it's, it's not just the vitamin C, which thank goodness, cause you know, just pure, you know, the, the pile of white powder kind of vitamin C, the, like just ascorbic acid. Um, I feel like there's not that in of itself, you can go too far and it can become oxidative in that concentrated form. So I think that the, the vitamin C in friends speaks to the, the synergy, right? That's plant synergy. It's always about synergy, right? I mean, <laughs> sometimes it's about isolated extracts. Like, yeah, whatever. It's great. It's much easier to study one thing rather than, you know, one thing plus all its friends and companion molecules. But uh, the, you know, I think that's part of the medicine in relationship to the digestive tract. So I think of the way that the way that we eat and the way that we consume whatever it is, whether it's, you know, super high glycemic things or more commonly like the like high oxidative oils. So like the hydrogenated oils, the, you know, just way overcooked oils, et cetera. I, I want, I've seen this for so many folks who kind of like, they have the like fast food coma thing and just like drinking pine needle tea. And I, I think it's part of that antioxidant effect along with, along with all it's everything else. So the aromatics, astringents, et cetera. Um, but I think that that antioxidant effect is part of that. Um, I can't imagine it not being, you know, and, and in relationship to our, you know, our respiratory tract, I had a, a client, this is a couple of years ago and they were pack a day smokers. Um, and they were that one of our things, one of our therapeutics was to get them to just be absolutely chock full loaded with antioxidants. Like that was the first step is like, okay, don't reduce if you can, but let's just start every single time you have a cigarette, just take as many antioxidants as you can. So having them on like turmeric and just like a handful of raspberries, um, and then pine needle tea. And that was like a simple, like, just put that into your morning routine. Like they, they really loved it. That was like one of the, the plants that they had that was in their backyard that they were like, they could connect to and like actually be with. Um, and that was, that was one of the things that we had them, do. we, me and the mouse in my pocket that I had them, I asked them to do uh, was to really just double down on trying to get antioxidants from all these sources, including the pine. So, Yeah. That's what I got on vitamin C nice. <laughs> and, the pine and the pine people. Yeah. You know, I get this. I love that you work with pine so much and you're, you have all these different ways of working with it. Hearing you talk makes me realize that I think of it as a seasonal plant in that mm. when the snow, like the snow comes and everything out there is covered, all the plants, mm. you know, in my garden are covered there's pine. And that's when I tend to work with pine is during the winter, which it's a long winter here. So, um, but yeah, I just, I'm kind of realizing that and maybe it's not such a seasonal plan. Like I could be turning to it a little bit more, you know, besides when it's just winter. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, I, I, I mean, that's that the year round medicine cabinet for sure is, it's just so steady. It's just so there and present. And I think it's so ubiquitous. It's kind of just this in the background thing. I feel, I think that's part of why there's an element of, oh, I feel like every herbalist is like, this herb is underrated. <laughs> You're like, you can only use so many herbs, honey, like calm down. But, but within the context um, of what we have as local medicine, I feel like there's this, especially here in Colorado, because that's pretty much uh, every tree you can see is, chances are good, right? That, you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to be a pine when you get to a certain elevation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's so ubiquitous. It's kind of just this green wall and people are like, wait a minute, I can totally use this. <laughs> uh, but I feel like, I don't know. I feel like there's an element too of, 
uh, your your landscape kind of telling you when you need certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like winter time is the perfect time for being inside and having stuck crud and and all the things. So I wonder if that's part of it too. Is like, is it because there's nothing else, or is it because you need it the most during that yeah. time of year? No, yeah. could be, could be. <laughs> Is there anything else that you feel like you're really excited to share about pine? I think the food aspect as well. Like there's, it depends on the pine, uh, but most of the pines, out here we have pinion pine. So there's the pine nuts and the kind of the seasonal relationship. You know, there's mast years where you'll, you'll have so many pine nuts, um, but pretty much all the pines have nuts that are similarly delicious there might just be a little bit harder to get to um when i was studying forestry this is in nau that was when i first kind of got introduced to pinion pine as as a food and you know kind of the um i was sitting down there and the one of the professors working with folks who were paiute uh in relationship to basically like how they harvested pinion pine, how it worked into their mythology and to kind of their culture. Um, and we ended up um, studying about like the, the way that cones will open. You know, when, have you ever done that? Like you put a cone in front of a fire and it just mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. does that thing. Um, and I'm just, I'm like, oh, I'm hooked. So pine, <laughs> pine nuts like gathered that way, gathered with, you know, um, either the pinions or even like out here, we have ponderosas with these huge armored cones, but with the relatively tiny pine nuts, but they're still so good. Uh, so the pine nuts and the the little, uh, they're not steaming it, they're pollen producing cones, basically like the little ones that like you can pull them off and squish them and they'll kind of squirt their pollen goodness everywhere at the right time of year. Just eating those straight up uh, or on salads and then uh, working with them with the pine pollen, of course, like just gathering that and working with it in foods. It's like this little micro powerhouse of, you know, I mean, it's the reproductive parts of plants. They like concentrate all their goodness <laughs> into that, those reproductive parts, whether they're cones or flowers. So the, the pollen and then, oh, my recent love is sodas. Um, <laughs> have you ever made pine soda either out of no. the cone, either, either of the cones? Oh, it's so good. Um, it's like a, what do they call those ginger bugs? You can make kind of a mm-hmm. pine bug mm-hmm. and like use oh, the little, the little stamen cones aren't quite as resinous as the, like the seed bearing cones that are usually like, you know, they've got that seed goodness in there. So they protect themselves with like a giant coating of bitter, sticky resin. <laughs> Just not always as tasty with your, unless you had a lot of sweetener to your soda. Um, but Pascal Bader, you know, um, probably mm-hmm. saw that mm-hmm. name pronunciation, uh, but he uh, has this great recipe on just general fermentation and making your own soda. So I worked with that and started making these little like pollen cone um, pine soda. And it's just so good. And it's so fun and so simple. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Well, since you brought up pine pollen, I wonder if we should just visit that for a moment oh, because sure. pine pollen in somewhat recent years has kind of become a bit notorious. And um, have you seen products out there like pine pollen products that are incredibly expensive and they like come with all of these, um, you know, pretty incredible claims as well. So could you speak to that cat? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So I think I was looking the other day and there was a one ounce tincture of pine pollen and you always made it, you know, the ratio you make it at, I think it was like, I don't know, it's fairly strong. It's like a one to two or something like that. So it's like half an ounce of pine pollen, which whatever, it takes a little while to gather that. But it was like $120. And it was promising like all sorts of like fantastic erections and an increase in energy and all that coming from a base of it helps increase. It's a natural version of testosterone, um, which the the basics that I... You know, I've known a number of people who work with it and who are just like, I love this. I love how it makes me feel. Uh, but I've also heard from a number of people who are, you know, trying to do some sort of hormone replacement therapy and, you know, for, um, for the masculinizing nature of testosterone, they, they want to take testosterone. It's like they don't have a menstrual cycle and they can have a deeper voice and more facial hair, et cetera. And for those folks, pine pollen just doesn't cut the mustard. Like it doesn't do the thing. So I wonder about its efficacy in folks who are taking it for, you know, 
greater sexual libido or for greater energy or for muscle mass and bone density. I'm kind of, it's a little bit of like, I'm you sure that's doing what you think it's doing. Um, Cause it's in the concentrations that you're looking at in the studies, they're really high. Like they're not what you'd be getting necessarily from, from the dosages that are recommended on most of the products. And I can't speak to all the products that are out there. I've, I've seen a handful of them and kind of been like, mm, cool, moving on. But they're taking, they're recommending like, you know, two to three dropper fulls or, you know, maybe in the high end, you know, six to nine dropper fulls a day or, you know, as needed, whatever that means uh, in relationship to, <laughs> to pine pollen and helping you with energy and, um, and erectile function, et cetera. So there's, if you were going to do that, you need to like, you need to take a lot of pollen, which I, I feel like that's the experiment to do. That's the experiment that I'm waiting for. The study that I'm waiting for is someone taking, you know, two to five gram doses a day of pine pollen rather than, I don't know, I, I calculated it out because I was getting nerdy about it a little while ago of like, okay, if this is a one to two tincture and it's an ounce and you're taking three mils a day, that means you're getting 0. 0.00 whatever grams. It was like, it was kind of, it's kind of a microdose. I kind of yeah. think of it like taking I don't know. What would you take? Like a horsetail tincture. It's like, Ooh, like, I feel like that should maybe if you're going for like the salicylic acid for like healing connective tissue. You mostly want that in a tea. Like you'd want that and you want that in high amounts. Um, or like a raspberry leaf or something. If you're, you're taking it for something besides the astringency, um, you usually want that, you know, in fairly like almost food like doses. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of think of that same thing in relationship to pine pollen. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't work with it a ton as a medicine. So there, that's my, that's my caveat. That's my bias is I, <laughs> I haven't experimented with it a lot as medicine, but I also haven't experimented with horsetail tincture a lot as medicine. Cause I'm like, this seems silly. <laughs> like I want to give this in a tea. I know it works in tea. <laughs> so um, yeah. And you know, that being said, I, I'm open-minded to some study being like, Oh no, no, actually um, you can take nanograms you know, or you can take, zero zero you know a, a fifth of a milligram and you know it will still be good and still promote testosterone production in the body or mimic testosterone as like a sort of bioidentical testosterone the way that it's it's promoted on all these sites uh, but yeah i don't know it makes sense that it has a lot of dense nutrition in it mm -hmm. that's you see a lot of the traditional use and it's uh, it's it's used as a tonic like as a tonic in relationship to energy but it's usually used like in a decent dose, right? It's like, it's actually pretty much more in the food or, or even spice realm, like kind of more like, you know, a couple of grams to, you know, getting up into the, the high, you know, almost to 10 grams a day kind of a dose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was um, first taught to take a paper bag and put it over the pollen producing cones and give mm -hmm. it a shake and get the pollen in there. And then we would add it to like pancake or waffle mix. Um, yeah. And just you know, have that in there. So that was kind of yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me too. Um, okay. girl. <clears throat> so um, and for people who might not have heard of this, Karen Sherwood has um, taught me, and apparently Kat that too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, but that's that that food like dose. But it was taught mm -hmm. as like here's a nutrient dense, um, you know, wonderful gift that we can turn to. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I love all that you had to say, both with your caveats and open-mindedness. So appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, well, Kat, if you've shared what you want to share about pine, I would, which I just have absolutely loved every little bit of it. Um, I'd love to hear what kind of stuff that you have going on in your world. Like what projects are you working on? Oh, well, the thing I'm the most excited about uh, coming up, I'm my good friend and I, Brianna Wiles, have been scheming for the last oh God, since 2017, 2018, since we started doing kind of wild foods and herbalism programs together, um, we have been thinking about trying to make uh, an event, a conference that included not just herbalism, but kind of all the things that we geek out about and that we're nerdy and into all the time. So everything from um, ancestral skills, which is kind of like my original stomping grounds and entryway into herbalism to kind of more homesteading skills, um, and we finally, we finally did it. We've got it. We've got the, we've got our event um, site and we've got all of our teachers. And so it's called a forest to field festival. The idea being kind of like 
everything from, you know, the wild forest to the cultivated field, like trying to bring all those human skills together in one place. And we're holding it in September. And oh, I'm so excited about it. There's folks doing herbal first aid. And you know, what's the thing that what do the kids say FOMO? Um, I'm like, I already have FOMO. Cause I'm like, no, wait, I want to take all these classes and I can't because I'm organizing the event. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm just excited about that because I feel like oh, people are so ready for it after after 2020 and after like so much like distance and so much, um, I don't know, disembodiment, I feel like is the thing that came out of that, that era slash this era. And I feel like the antidote to all of that, like I was talking about this in the class the other day to like isolation and feelings of loneliness is embodiment. And so it's all the things that we could think of and all the teachers that we could think of, which it's been really cool to see it all come together. Uh, but all the people that we know are, are good at bringing together those embodied skills. So hmm. it's a little all over the place for topics because it's, you know, we have basket making and uh, kind of primitive, you know, fire by friction. Uh, and then we also have um, herbs for pregnancy and, you know, herbs for, you know, supporting the menstrual cycle and, you know, the help reproductive health for everybody, you know, those kinds of classes that are like tuning into your body, tuning into your health and kind of figuring out the signals that you need to help support that uh, as well as wild foods. And, um, oh, it's so cute. This is, this is more fangirling. We have Katrina Blair is going to come up, um, and teach some wild foods classes for us. And, um, yeah, there's there's lots of other classes there's like some herbal first aid classes and brianna and i of course are going to teach on herbalism and wild foods and it's a lot of a lot of just an immersive time for people to just like get uh dirt time if you're familiar with the tracker school you know lingo just like really getting your hands into the plants and kind of into everything so that's one of the things i'm the most excited about because it's just this cool like this cool collaboration. I'm kind of like, Oh, great. This is happening. Like, wow. I'm like, I'm this little like point of just like, would you, would you like to do this? It's, it should be really fun. And everyone's the response has been really, Oh, you know, when your community is just like, yes, that's been the response. It's been mm. so, it's been so soul feeding to be able to get into that and do that. Mm. Um, that's so. lovely. And where exactly is that going to be? It's in Hotchkiss, Colorado. So it's the Western slope of Colorado um, at a place called big bees, delicious orchards. Um, which is, uh, it's kind of like it sounds, it's this organic orchard that's been there for a number of years. Um, and they have, we're gonna have music there as well. So they're a, kind of, they're an orchard and then they have kind of a music venue as well. So we'll be able to operate that oh, as well. Fun. And um, I know Ayla Nerio is coming. I'm like, oh my oh, God. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. um, this, see, this is so much, that's the only reason I'm doing this is to like, I'm gonna meet <laughs> all these cool people. Um, and yeah, what are the um, dates? too on that cat. yeah it's the uh the september 8th 9th and 10th of uh, this year of 2023 so it's coming Lovely. up it's, it's over yeah. my birthday weekend so what a great way to celebrate <laughs> oh are you gonna come oh well, uh, well i can see you there that would be fabulous um wait when's your birthday september 8th oh that's my dad's birthday Aww. oh that's so interesting that's part of why we chose the date of the event um mm is I was like, okay, where can we put it? And I'm like, somewhere in September, I'm like, oh, we're doing September 8th. Like that's mm. bringing in all the good medicine I can for the, the first year and to, to make it just good. Yeah, oh, that's so fun. Oh, oh. Yeah. So yeah, that and I am teaching at the AHD conference in the fall. So that's, oh, one of my other loves um, is low dose botanicals. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen the symposium focus this year is gonna be on um, or one of the intensive focuses is going to be on low-dose botanicals. So it's me and a couple of other clinicians who are going to talk about working with low-dose herbs. And Fabulous. So, Much needed information. Yeah, totally. I know. It's such a, oh God, it's such the world. I feel like when I first, which is as it should be, it's like start out, you know, low and slow as it were. But I feel like I've seen in my own students in the past, you know, 10 years, there's just like, oh, I don't know, this sort of fearful mythological, like, oh, Lobelia, it's so toxic, like, don't, and I feel like that's, that's what I'm excited about, is kind of breaking that open, and just being like, okay, okay, yes, it's toxic, and also, like, it's so useful, and here's how to do it, and yeah, so that's another piece that I'm really excited about getting into, it'll be kind of my project over the summer, is a deep, nerdy dive into 
the realm of toxic herbs. Wonderful. Any other projects before I ask the final question? Yeah, sure. So let's see. Um, yeah, I had to think about this before coming on. Let's see what oh, we have plant camps, which we've been doing. Um, I've been doing with Brianna for the past, since 2020. That was our, like our first year. And um, it's, it's like a mini version of what I described with forest to field. So we do ancestral skills and we do, we kind of, again, immersive into the landscape, but it's this intensive, um, and it's always just so fun because people are just like, oh, it's so exciting to meet other people that are into this because most of the time I'm kind of like the weirdo in the situation and I'm like, oh no, this is great. Like I can, we can totally all be weirdos together um, and just really dive into like the, the botany and the plant ID with herbalism, medicine making, and then getting into the ancestral skills um, and kind of just nature connection. The yes, it's all nature, I get it, but like really into whatever the landscape it is that we go to. So we're doing one in Connecticut next week and then another one in Colorado in the, ooh, somewhere there August, around August 12th. I think it's the second weekend in August. Um, wow. So that's, oh, I just have loved doing that the past couple of years. It's just really good medicine. It's kind of a break from my clinical world where I'm just like reviewing cases um, and doing student mentorship and kind of talking in a more of a heady space and getting into more of that. Oh, just hands-on bodied place. Um, and then, oh, and then what else? Oh, and then we have our, we've been working on um, an online course in the past couple of years trying to, so we've had our students who are in our plant camps and they're like, well, how can we learn more? Like, what can we do? And we've been kind of piecemealing resources together. And then I think it was last, yeah, last year, um, we launched a course that is basically kind of like a connecting point with lots of medicine making and um, just herbalism skills and actions and energetics and kind of basically like a furtherance of diving into the herbalism portion of what we teach during our plant camp in person classes. Um, and that's, we're in the middle, we're in the middle of our, our spring course right now, or kind of our spring summer course. And then we're kind of so that's just been so fun. That's just a bunch of like 20 people kind of, we get to check in with every month and be like, so what did you do? <laughs> like, how did it go? Uh, with like tasting herbs and trying recipes. Um, and then writing, oh, I'm kind of going to go on a bit of a sabbatical year this next year. Um, it starts in base. Well, I guess it really starts after the HG conference, but you know, I'm, I'm switching up my work a good bit so that I have more time for writing. I've been, wanting to do more work with writing about trees and tree medicine for a long time. So I'm, I'm really excited to have just time for that too. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from that as well. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. I'm ready for your next question. You're ready for the final question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I realize this could be a big question, but mm. um, you know, something that strikes you as particularly helpful and useful that's in your herbal first aid kit? Mm. Well, you know, I, I, in thinking about this question, I was just on um, a camping trip for about seven days where we, we take all of our, our advanced students into retreat and we go to a place called the Poudre Canyon here in Colorado and then we go out to the Pawnee Buttes. So it's kind of mountains to grasslands uh, and you're, you know, out with a bunch of humans for a long period of time, kind of a distance um, for many support. So I always like beef up my first aid kit. And I think the most, the biggest thing is just the, the formulas that I use on the regular for me and my community tend to be for pain and sleep, for digestive, what have you, and for immune support and slash wound support. So I feel like that's, it's a bunch of things, but that tends to be the, the kind of pieces that I tend to, inter that I tend to happen to me the most, like I get respiratory stuff and digestive stuff and menstrual pain and I have trouble sleeping. And so it's basically for me, but fortunately there's a lot of other people that are unwell in a similar way to me. So uh, I think just those formulae um, are one of the bases for my first aid kit. Uh, and then the immune and the digestive formula is one of the herbs in there is pine, but, you know, immune formula is, you know, speaking of lotus herbs, is, you know, poke and pine and asclepias. And so kind of a lot of, I tend to get respiratory sick. Um, so kind of that, that supports along with kind of some berberine containing herbs. I, 
I, you know, teach in an herb school and it is predominantly um, folks who identify as cis women. Like, so it's like the UTI piece is always like, oh, that's a recurring theme. Um, that was something that came up on this trip recently. So, you know, those, those herbs that are kind of respiratory support as well as you know, urinary tract support, uh, as well as just general immune support. So there's, there's the old standbys, there's, you know, echinacea in there as well and bone set. Um, and then the pain and sleep formula, uh, I feel like that's, uh, that's always, that's always present. That's kind of one of my constants. And that's something that just seems to, that's so useful. I mean, that's one of those, whether somebody has just, oh God, we had a gal who um, was on a program and she somehow like put her hand on a door and it caught her thumb and just like tore it from the whole seam and uh, not tore the whole thumb. Sorry. That sounds way more dramatic, but like a big old cut. And so like for those moments to like, I just have monkey mind. I feel like that's like pain sleep formula is just a constant. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I have, I have lots of things in my first aid kit. I'm like, I can keep going, but those, I think as far as formulas, those three and then Lobelia, always Lobelia, mm -hmm. right? Whether you have somebody who's uh, having an asthma attack or who's just in a lot of pain, like musculoskeletal wise, I feel like internal external use is so, even though it's like this very, like, it's basically just a relaxant and an emetic, it's like, but it's such a good one. <laughs> so I feel like I end up leaning on that quite a bit just in general, right. For all these, um, for everything from kind of like, I need to vomit. So like I eat something real weird to, you know, someone with menstrual pain to someone with back pain to, you know, someone who's just having like a respiratory distress and stuffness. I feel like that's the one, that's the only one that I keep pretty much as a simple, um, other than like echinacea capsules, you know, a concentrated echinacea capsule. Uh, so yeah, those are the big players. I feel like and there's, there's more, but yeah. Like bigs. yeah. So the seasoner opener, which is the episode that publishes, um, right at the beginning, mm -hmm. I did what's in my herbal first aid kit. And I said, I choose them for three main topics, which is, like kind of anxiety, sleep, digestion, mm. and respiratory stuff. So I love that we have those yeah. like same things going on. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd be so curious to see your formulas. I'm like, let's let's share notes because yeah. um, I'm always so curious. Everybody's got their like their standbys um, for kind of what works and what works for them and what they've seen work for everybody. So mm -hmm. well, just hearing me. you talk about like camping, I would bring an entirely different kit for like first aid kit for camping versus mm -hmm. in my mind, I was thinking about um, this year I'm going to Red Rocks in Colorado mm -hmm. to see Torimus and um, also going to Mexico. So I kind of had that mm -hmm. on my mind of like the different needs for those, you know, airplane trips. And so it really is like so contextual in terms of where you're going, why you're going, all of that. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, for travel, actually, this um, things like berberine containing herbs, part of why I keep berberine containing herbs in my immune formula is for that, like, the digestive, like, creatures and infection, mm -hmm. and also, like, for nausea, like, that side of things. And then I just activated charcoal and, you know, yep. wound, my list. like <laughs> pine resin, you know, salve and, you know, muscle rub salve and, you know, liniment with pine resin and camphor and menthol and cayenne in it and, you know, all the, all the other first aid products. But that's, I feel like I've traveled to so many places and I always end up like, oh God, that's the only other herbal thing that's in there, probably an adaptogenic formula, which also has pine and eleuthero and rhodiola in it. Um, for the, the like, pine shows up so much. yeah, total all well, the, the expanding of the lungs uh, mm -hmm. or the, the kind of ability to just sort of feel like, this movement in the lungs, I feel like is so important for that. But I, I end up, I don't know. I love to look at other people's first aid kits. Cause I'm, this is the, this is when I get sick. I'm like, these are the things that tend to happen to me. So I tend to bring that mostly along. So I'm like, and surely other people, most other people will get sick in a similar way. It's just so totally different from person to person. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kat, this has been so fabulous. I've loved learning about pine and, um, your pine elixir looks so fabulous mm. and folks can download that in the show notes or at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. And thank you so much for sharing your first aid kit stuff, as well as like all the projects you're working on. I'm really excited for those. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Rosalie. This was really fun. Yeah. It's been fabulous. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com 
to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of this show. There you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch. You can also visit Kat directly on Instagram at cat underscore the underscore herbalist. If you want more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. With that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the herbswithrosaliepodcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every comment that comes in, and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts about pine. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. So for this herbal tidbit, I'm sharing one of my favorite Mary Oliver poems. It's titled, When I am among the trees. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me and daily. I'm so distant from the hope of myself, in which I have goodness and discernment, and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches, and they call again. It's simple, they say, and you too have come into this world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light, and to shine.